three is a three-state accuracy that measures what fraction of residues is correctly predicted in either of those three states, helix, draw, and other. And the answer for method A is 60 percent. The answer for method B is 63. Now the question to you is B better. <laughs> That's a very careful answer. I like it. Uh, so how would you uh, let me let me be mean to you? How how would you suggest to define it? So let me, just whoever could, couldn't hear that, the statement here is, so in order to answer that question, you have to define what is better. And for instance, if I wanted to predict strands better, then the answer is not B is better, because we don't see that on this slide. And that's a very valid point. Let's assume my definition is that I want to improve Q3. So this value that I see. And then your colleague said, in that particular case, the answer is B is clearly better. I challenge you, this is not correct. It may be very obvious, but it's not quite true. Because you, there are a couple of questions you have to ask first. Uh, well, the, 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 the simplest one here is, are they actually both Q3? So are they actually computing the same value? Let's assume that is the case. You will be surprised how many papers compare different values on this. And in some sense, that is the part that you answered. Uh, this is the part that you answered. Not in, but here's another question that you have to immediately ask, yes? Um, do they use the same data? Exactly. And in, in fact, that may sound very trivial to you. But the vast majority of comparisons is done because somebody publishes a number. When you redo their work, very often you use a different data set. What could be a reason for using a different data set? Exactly. The data grows constantly. And typically the, the reality in biology in most fields is that the more data we accumulate, the more we know. And the, the, the more time in advance, very often the data is getting more accurate. So you want to use as much as you can, typically, the most recent data. So that means you have a very high incentive if you redo a method that has been done by somebody a few years ago, a year ago, a few months ago. You want to redo it. Okay? So the probability that you use a very a different data is very high. Now, assume you could argue what you want to do is you want to retrain that method that has been published on your data. Most of the time, certainly for old methods, this is not trivial. Data is not available, you cannot get, make it run, uh, there is all kinds. You remember for the neural network predictions that I talked about, you have to set up the networks, you have to have the data sets, you have to do an alignment, the way the alignment is done is important, and, and, and there's a lot of complexity involved here. It's not easy to redo that in your, in your same environment. But okay, now, assume that in both cases, the answer were that they in fact used the same data set. Uh, and say both use 114 to assess and to come up with the number 60 and 63. And both took, used random splits and both used a half of the testing set. Now, can we say? Do they differ? Is that enough, what I put on the whiteboard? Yes? Yeah, which could they use? So, one, the, the same 100? Yes, very good point. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, very, 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 very good. Yes, they use the same. Same 100. Is that enough? Beyond to something there. Yes, the 100 are the same. Exactly. The random split is very, very possible that the actual test set is not the same. They start with the same 100 proteins, but they split them randomly, so they split them differently. Or, you know, odds are very high that they split them differently. So that gets to the next issue. So, 
they must somehow you must rotate through in your uh, cross validation such that you tr test on every single protein once. Okay, that is important. That brings us to a different issue here. Is a random split between training and testing okay? So in this particular case, for instance, in a two-fold cross-validation, I use one half of the data set for training and the other half for testing, and then I switch around. And this way I compile a testing value for every single protein exactly once. But the question is, in this assumption here, I have a random split between the two halves. Is random the right way of doing this split? Can I just do that or could anything go wrong? Yes? Ah, that's a very interesting point. And that, in fact, is a very, very good point. And that is the kind of point that is taken, often taken care of in, in standard packages such as Weka, which is, in fact, that ultimately, in order to make the device work well, you want that the device trains on a representative distribution of HEL, for instance. But for me as, as a user of devices, I would argue, well, that's your problem as a developer. So if you don't do that, maybe you will not get out the power of the device that you can. But actually, in terms of comparison, that is not the major problem. Then you will overestimate your performance. Uh, sorry, underestimate your performance, not overestimate. So for me as a user, if you tell me this is going to be 70%, it's actually going to be 75. I don't care. Makes me happy. If you tell me it's 80%, it's going to be 70, then I'm going to be frustrated. And if I repeatedly use that device at some point, I will give up. So again, back to the question, is that all right? No, it is not, because there's something important here. We have to watch out that there's no overlap between testing and training. Yes, you would essentially start with a data set of 100 proteins that have no overlap. But you have to check that this is the case. Now, assume that the overlap between training and testing is such that you could do comparative modeling. Then you wouldn't apply secondary structure prediction methods. If you, if you could apply comparative modeling between the two, you would look up the structure, not secondary structure. You would up, look up the entire thing. So, you may, need to make sure that there's nothing, so between testing and training, you're not in the blue region here. Okay, so when we get to the next issue, I assume we took care of all of that. My next question, say we take the same proteins, we look at the same measures, uh, we have the, te the, the testing and training has no overlap. One is 60, one is 63. Now the question boils down to the simple question, is it significant? So back to what you said before, you're right. It depends on what you mean by better. But now I'm sort of refining my definition of what I mean by better. Is it significant? How would you answer that question? Yes. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks. Yes. I would probably uh, first check how much more uh, computation I have, I have to do for the for the three percent. So uh, that's a great point. So you, you're absolutely right. It's a very very let's call it a hacker view, but a very important one. Uh, the degree to which an improvement is relevant has to do with the, with the time spent on it. If, if for a tiny improvement you spend too much energy, too much resources, then it's not valid. Or if the, the improvement is, costs you or brings you so much that that is a... F but you need to somehow have a cost, uh, a ratio between what you put in and what you gain. That's true. That's a very important issue. But in this particular case, the, the, the issue of significant is still, I'm still on the level of, I don't care about money at the moment. I care more about the science issue. Yes?
Yes, that's true, but what is 0 0.05? Sorry. What is 0 0.05? Uh, my of what? Uh, of <laughs> so 3% three, 3 is less than 5. Is it significant? Yeah. Yes. Is it significant? Uh, yes. So 5% is a magic number because we have five fingers? <laughs> The, 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 you allude to something that is exactly what I'm, what I'm after. Uh, but you're not, again, you're, you're hitting something, but not the point. <laughs> get the nail closer, or the, the, get the hammer closer to the nail. So it's the right direction, but what exactly do I have to ask in order to answer the question of significance? And you guys are onto something that is totally right. We will get back to that point. Uh, this is, in some sense, also his point. We ever get back to that point. But let me put out a different word: statistical significance. Yes. You have to calculate how many uh, this represent, how many of the data is represent. You have one hundred. Yes, and that essentially, you're totally right. That's the idea of of putting it in a distribution and the point really back to what this one means here the standard deviation of 10 percentage points means that 72 plus minus 10 gives you about 90 percent of the distribution uh, 66 percent of the distribution uh, no 90 percent of the distribution so this is 90 percent of the distribution plus minus one standard deviation within the error is 66%, two standard deviations is 90%, and we are plus minus is two standard deviations. So essentially, 72 minus, so 60, between 62 and 82, you have roughly 90% of this entire distribution. And that ultimately brings us to your five, I guess. Uh, so a rule of thumb, that 10 minus five probability, or there are different ways of looking at it. And this is just one way of looking at the plus minus sigma. Now, the plus minus sigma, that's just part of the distribution, and it's the number of points, is not exactly answering the question, is it significant? So, you would argue that a, a sigma of plus minus 10 gives you 90% of the distribution. Is not answering the question, is three percentage points 60 and 63 differs by three percentage points. Is that statistically significant? And for that, we need the standard error. Anybody, any idea how I get from a, from a distribution that you see on the whiteboard to a standard error? Rule of thumb, don't need an equation, what's the idea? So the simplest thing is essentially you, the standard error you get by uh, taking the standard deviation square rooting, dividing by the square root of the number of points, in this particular case 10, 10 by 10 is about 1. Plus minus 1 would be one standard error. Okay, so plus minus 1, 3 is higher than plus minus 1. Okay, so at least within 90% or it's even, it's even higher than it's just a little, well, it's about three standard deviations, so it's in the 99% uh, category. So this is actually in the 10 minus 1, so it's less than 5% uh, statistical significance. It's 10 minus, uh, minus 2 so the statistical significance, right? Um, okay, so it's statistically significant, and that gets us back to, to the issue of science. But before we get into the issue of science, um, let's look at this one, yes? Because one standard error is one percentage point. One standard error difference is within 66% of the data, right? Two standard error differences is 90% of the data. Three standard errors is roughly three percentage points, and that is 99% of the data. And that is a statistical significance of 10 minus 2. One in 100. Okay? Roughly. This is all rule of thumb waving. You don't need machines for that or Excel. This is essentially you can immediately look at that. 
and by that statistical significance, it is significant. Now we get to the next question, method B. That in fact, in this model here is the one that is, uh, is better, statistically significant better, is 20 years old. Is it still better? Yes, well, that's true. We know more proteins today, and method B, uh, method A, has used all of these proteins and got 60 percent, and method B has not used them and got 63. So is it better? you have uh, let me first give the, uh, the, 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 the answer that I see is the dominant one. It doesn't really matter. Provided and implicitly this is something that you talk about and that's really important. Provided that your data set that you test it with is representative of what you believe is the best today. Okay? Now if your hundred would have been the ones from ten years ago then that's nonsense. But if you have more data today and the hundred represents everything you have and the old method is better, and it's better. In fact, you could even argue the fact that it's old and still gets better suggests that it's less likely to have overtrained on your 100 proteins. And in some sense, it, 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 it may, may even be more positive. It doesn't matter. Statistically significant means it's statistically significant, and that's the end of that. Um, but now let's get into the other issue. So you have developed your method, it has taken your master thesis, it has taken six months or something like that, and you come to the point where one of the two methods is better. And you see statistically significant, you see the three percentage point, you have established, say it's your method, that is actually better. Is there anything else you could do? So the point that I'm after here is while you did your the you essentially did the development, new data may have been added. These new proteins, these new data, you could use to test your data, your own method. You used what you did six months ago, and you optimized everything in the development for those proteins, for those data. There's something new that you could tap into and, and sort of check yourself. And it's always a good idea. In biology, the field grows so fast that in six months, typically, there's something substantially added. Often, this is a little bit too small to really see big differences. But at least it gives you sort of the feeling or g gives you an okay go-ahead if you're in, a, in the same direction and a little bit more careful if this suddenly drops totally. Then you over-optimize something. Um, okay, let's talk about another aspect of cross-validation and of machine learning. Say we had this case of 300 proteins. Half of them have been used for training, half of them have been used for testing. And um, let's, let's just assume we have been rotating through and this is sort of sober. Now, in your paper, you put a table. In this table you say there is a variety of different Q3s that you get for different neural networks. So for the number of hidden units 15, 30 and 45 you get slightly different results. So your conclusion in the method now is that the best method is the one that uses 30 hidden units. And your method has a prediction accuracy of 64% on average. Again, there will be a standard error. Um, is that right? Do you see any flaw? So there's a flaw in my argument. This is what 99% of the machine learning applications do. Still, there's a very crucial and problematic flaw in this. Okay, let's get back to the idea of training and testing. Cross-validation. The idea is that you have an entire data set, 300 proteins in this particular case, and you take some fraction and hide it under the table, pretend you don't know it, and see how value machine learning has generalized by presenting that hidden set. You do that three times, and you select one of those three as best. 
using your testing set. Does it become obvious? The point is, you hiding the set under the table, that it needs to be hidden. The moment you make a decision on the set that was under the table, that moment you optimize a free parameter. The free parameter you optimize here is the number of hidden units. And you took the set from under the table to make that decision. That implies you did not use it as a test set, you used it to develop. You optimize on that data set. Is that clear? What you should have done instead is you should have had a three-fold split. where you have a training set, cross-training set and a test set. Now, this table here should be done on the cross-training set. And on the cross-training set, you then say, okay, for my cross-training set, 30 is the best. And now I apply it to the test set. And in this application to the test set, I actually see this is not the best. But that's what I should stick with. So now, your statement is, I believe that the best method is 30 hidden units and that my prediction accuracy is 61. This one here is irrelevant. Maybe there is something wrong in what you did. But the best solution that you have for your paper is to essentially say 30 hidden units, prediction accuracy 61. Okay? It's not optimal. But choosing anything else would optimize on the test set. And that you have to carefully avoid to do. Now, in terms of the rotation, you then still have to rotate the entire thing through. So in this particular image here, you would have, in fact, to train three different models. So use that for training the first step, use that for training the second step, and use that for training the last, and rotate the other three through. And you could do it in different splits. So whether you use one, yeah? Yes. And then we use the test set to verify if yes. it is going well or not. Yes. And yeah. the training and the test data set will not overlap in any case. Yes. So Th that is the cross training set. That's fairy tale land. Yes, that's the, that is true. That's what you find in, in most publications. And whoever doesn't apply machine learning for any important real, business, real life business can do it that way. The moment you get serious about applying machine learning, the world gets more complicated. And the way it gets more complicated again is you have to see that you don't use the training set only for some steps and that you never use the test set for optimizing any, any decision. In this example that I showed here, uh, well, let me get back in this, in this fairy tale land of cross validation that is in fact the only that is available in any public package uh, is you make a decision on some aspect of your model based on test data. Now in this particular case I show hidden units. This could be in a weaker package you run SVM, you run uh, support, uh, a neural network, you, you, you run some rule-based systems and you find the rule-based system is the best or the linear regression, or whatever you find. Any of these decisions you cannot make on the test set, yes? So, what, what are the hidden units? Are they uh, samples from the test set, or...? Yes. Okay, then I, I got the wrong idea. I saw that there were hidden layers from the neural network. Yes, they are. I'm sorry, they, they are. Uh, this is the, new, the hidden units from the neural network. This is just one example to show. In fact, this is open uh, any machine learning application and most, almost every single one you find some situation like that. But they say we have three different models. In this particular case I looked at three different hidden units. Again it could be an SVM versus linear regression. Uh, or it could be using that input versus that input. It could be 15 versus 30 versus 45 hidden units in a neural network. But the values here are the values that I get for the test set. And then I say in the end of my paper, I tried many different ways of solving my problem, and the best way was this. 
Because that is the highest number. And that is the mistake. It's a mistake, again, that the vast majority of people who apply machine learning do. Still a mistake. Most people never find out that it's a mistake. But in, in computational biology, you have many people using these methods. And many of these methods are around for many years. And then you, over the years, find out that almost nothing survives because of this type of problem. Okay, so you need to find a more complex way of doing cross-validation. Uh, and the complex version of doing the cross-validation has nothing to do with doing a different split in terms of uh, not half-half, but having 70% uh, or whatever. Or one, leave one out, so only one for testing, and then you do uh, 300 rotations. This is, this is all not relevant. This is what the entire literature is for, uh, with, doing, uh, with the differences between those. And they, they have importance, but the real, real problem uh, is the big one here. That the door is not open, uh, closed. Um, again, everybody understands what the problem is. That is one solution. Mm -hmm. Yes? Trade and you want to define one of the parameters, which is the number of the hidden neurons. Yes. And actually, you're using your test, the S kind of the size with the optimized the number of hidden neurons. And then you see that this works best on my test, which doesn't make much sense. The yes. so next one, so you have one third as the training set and one third to define that parameter. And then you use another test set to, to try to see what it is. Okay, that is absolutely right. Let me just repeat it. Since, since you had to, to say it, I do the same thing again uh, because not everybody heard it. So the problem again is that in this table, you do not use the training performance, but you use the test performance. You use the hidden set, the under the table set, to make a decision. That's the no-no. That's the problem. The way out is that now the green one here, the cross-training set, is the one that you should use to make any decision of a free parameter. The free parameter in this particular case is number of hidden units. The free parameter in a typical example could be look at the linear regression versus an SVM. Look at different basis function for an SVM, or look at different numbers of hidden units. Uh, look at different types of input. There can be all kinds of things. The point is, all of these decisions have to be made on that cross-training set. And again, don't forget that these sets have to be mutually independent, so there should not be an overlap. Uh, training in this language of the neural network here really is choosing the connections. Cross-training choose the architecture. If you don't talk about a neural network, we talk about an SVM, it's still sort of choosing the basis function, radio basis function, and some of the free parameters. And even if it's not that, then still it's the type of machine learning device you do. It's the type of coding you do. There are always a lot of questions before you have solved a problem that you have to optimize, and they will all be optimized on this one. Once you have that optimization, you will no longer question alternatives. You will just say, one is optimal, and that I apply for my test set. Ideally, the only one you ever look at. Yes? Why is it a problem? No, I'm sorry. So this is uh, this is just a totally made-up example. So what he asks is why should the cross-training better be better here and the, the test set be better here? There's, there's no reason for that, but it could happen. Um, I made up this example, uh, but I've seen examples like that. And what I want to illustrate in this example is it could be that something is optimal, some setting, in this particular case again is the number of hidden units, is optimal here, and when I get to my latest set, it's not optimal. So the question is, how could that happen? And ultimately, the answer is, it can happen because the data set I start with is not representing the entire universe of all the data. Hence, my test set is not completely representative. There are differences. And I, in fact, did not learn everything. I, there is some sort of overtraining that has happened. 
This is exactly what it tells me. So if I had a situation like that, I would immediately realize something went wrong. I don't know how to correct it. Because again, let me repeat the mantra here. Uh, every optimization has to be done on that set. I cannot look at that set and optimize. So that also means I can find out that something is wrong, but I don't know how to correct it. The moment I would correct it, I would get back and use the test set for training. I cannot do that. Or for making decisions. I cannot do that. So ultimately, back to your question, why is it that this is higher? We cannot answer. The fact that the cross-training gives a different optimal, the optimum situation than the, the testing suggests that there's a problem and we cannot fix it. But we do make the estimate that this one here, the suboptimal number, 61 not 62, is the performance of my method. Bless you. Yeah? Sorry, uh, let, let me get, before I, I didn't quite understand your question, I'll, I'll get back to your question. Uh, let me point out one thing here. The word test, so there, there are different ways, cross-validation uses the word validation, and, and there's the word test in here and training, and there are different way, words around. So some people use test, some people use validation, different communities sort of argue that one answer is right. So your question is, isn't it strange to call that test? Or why? Um, because um, the test group is not used um, to judge uh, the performance of the yes. worldwide network and um, it's not used um, to optimize the Yes. That's why I call it test. You, you call it whatever you want to call it. This is the, the important thing. Understand what it means. You call it validation, you call it test, you call it alpha, you call it uh, whatever you want. You call it Munich. The important thing here in this set is it is the one with which you want to gauge future. Call it future. Call it general. This is your proxy to when I apply this method in the future for data that I've never seen before. How well will it perform? And that is the set. And again, I rotate around so that every protein in my set is used once so that I don't bring in any bias. But that, that is what it is called. Maybe we, we, I should really go, go uh, change that and call it generalize or future. Uh, but this is important that you understand that. What, what you name it, I don't care. Yeah? That is not true. So again, so the, in, in this understanding that I call that the future, my, my fu this, this is the one that helps me gauge what will happen tomorrow for a data set that I don't know. And that implies that it has all to do with this, this number is essentially exactly the answer. What will happen tomorrow? I argue that tomorrow, for whatever I will say, the best compatible with my data for whatever will happen to tomorrow is 61%, is my estimate. Okay, that is under the assumption that whatever I have today somehow represents the universe to some extent. I can sort of gauge the limit to that in my standard error and I can look at the distribution, I can see uh, some of the error that I do, but ultimately at some point I will say maybe the future will look different but the best I can state today is exactly that. And the way to, from today's data set, to come to the best prediction of the future is exactly that. And not that. Okay? Ideas clear? Okay, so then we get into the membrane prediction. Jonas already began. Uh. So the first question is what to put around a cell. So a cell is essentially as you know, bacteria live with a single, single cell creatures. Uh, they live as single cells. 
By the way, are there any bacteria that live in not as single cells? Are there multi cell bacteria? Something like that does exist. This is biology. Almost always there's something that you can find amazingly. And there are certainly colonies of bacteria. Uh, but in principle, you want to distinguish between inside and outside. Between what is this organism and what's the outside. So what do you put around life? Inside is life. Outside is, 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 is something else. What could you put to pr protect the inside from the outside? Membrane. What is a membrane? A lipid bilayer. A lipid bilayer. Why lipid? Uh, what are the properties of lipids? Nothing can get in, but can get out. So why is lipid such a great idea that, that you're 100% on? You, 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 what's so great about lipids that nothing can get in? What is the nothing that cannot get in? Lipids can get in. For instance, and that's the point. We live in water, so life begins in water, and you, nothing gets in is defined behind the background. You live in water, right? Uh, and water doesn't get into the lipid, but you can exchange. Um, and let's just begin with this. Okay. This is not quite working. Well, the wool is not starting. <coughs> because the cell membrane can. Okay, now we have. Sorry for that. So, by the way, this is a cell. What is that? Flagella. What is it used for? Does anybody know? So he obviously knows. <laughs> yeah. So, so move around, right? So essentially, you some bacteria have flagella. It's like little propellers, and in fact, in some cases, they rotate like a helicopter propeller, uh, and that gives you propulsion. So that makes bacteria move. Uh, these here, however, are sort of sensor sensory devices. The difference between a bacterium and a eukaryotic cell, essentially, most. In a, in, a, in a simplified way of looking at it, the bacterial cell has a membrane around and inside somehow everything happens. While in the eukaryotic cell you have, a, for instance, a nucleus. So you have different compartments. Do you have any idea what is in the nucleus? What is special in the nucleus? Well, that's where you carry your DNA. That's where all the genetic material is. In some sense, you can think about it as a protective mechanism, but you can also think about it as a mechanism in which you sort of have different compartments that are optimized for different tasks. So it's much simpler to, to reach a higher level of complexity if you sort of localize certain tasks to some places, like a big factory, to have some things done in, in other places. The way you separate out inside and outside, you already uh, said, is by using the lipid. And there's a lipid bilayer. Bi means two. So there are two layers of lipid. One, the head group, as it is called, is standing, sticking to the outside. The head group, therefore, dissolves in water, uh, is hydrophilic on both sides here. Uh, and in between, you have these, this is one side, the other side, so one layer, the other layer, two layers. And there is a certain span of a typical membrane, ballpark three nanometers. Uh, and in in terms of protein folding, so what you do typically in a protein is you have outside of the protein, you have residues that want to solve in water, so they're hydrophilic, and inside you have proteins that want to uh, residues that want to stick together, hydrophobic. Now, in this particular environment, 
it's turned upside down. If you want to put a protein through the membrane, then in fact you turn this, this rule upside, inside out. You want the helix to be a hydrophobic facing the lipid. When you move a helix uh, or, or some protein in a cell in this direction here, you can relatively freely move. In that direction, you cannot. And this brings us back to exactly what you said. You want to avoid that intrusion into the cell is easy. You want to avoid that things can get easily in there. Now, how could you imagine that you, in fact, intrude as an attacker, bacterium attacking another bacterium, intrude to the cell? How could you possibly do that? Yes? I still didn't understand. So you walk around the cell and then do you do what? You knock on the door and you ask, can I get in? I, I'm not sure, but there, there's, some, there's some method that you can, I've heard about it, that you can um, just, just kind of solve the, the, the lipids or merge together. Yeah, yeah. And we, we, you, you got a point. We will get to that in a minute. Um, but, well, the hammer. Why not take a hammer? Because you may argue bacteria don't hammer, have hammers. Uh, ha, they do. There's a story from Marek Basler. Uh, this so-called type 6 secretion system is not really relevant. What is relevant is uh, there is this, this cylinder and there is something that you could call a hammer or something, uh, a gun and you shoot something into the membrane. You poke a hole into the membrane of your target and you shoot something in there. Okay? And the thing that you shoot in, so some bacteria have actually two membranes, you shoot from, from this, the, the red cell is the attacker, to the blue cell and you shoot completely through the membrane. So how can you do that? You can only do that by, and I'm not showing all the uh, other things. You can only do that by having a very, very long push here. This long push is about 700 nanometers long. So you essentially have a gun that extends over the entire cell. It builds up in, in a minute and then in a microsecond it collapses and pushes the bullet through. That's exactly what they do. It's a bacterial attack. Now, assume that you have, so this one here is the attacker. Uh, and this is the one that's being attacked. What do you believe this cell is going to do? Well, you see it somehow here already. Oh, what I didn't say is where this happens here, where the attack happens, whether it's here, here, or here, or here, or here, we, we don't really see. So Marek Basler from the Biocenter in Basel has a couple of movies and you see they sort of come up at different places. Uh, they grow through the entire cell, cell and then suddenly they shoot. Now, the moment they have shot, what this one does, it shoots back, back at exactly the same position. So the green one is the attacked cell, shoots back. And that's the idea here. And tries to kill in the same way. Uh, let's just get one on top of that. Imagine the green one runs out of bullets. Okay, it's being shot at. Doesn't have any bullets left. So really what you shoot here are proteins. So can I call them bullets now for simplicity. What do you believe is going to happen? So it's being fired at. It doesn't have bullets anymore. What, what, what would the bacterium do? Uh, you guys have never seen it. I mean, maybe in, start, in, these, in these sort of 
uh, futuristic Star Wars kind of movies, they, what, what happens if, if no, the laser doesn't work? Uh, so when I was young, they, they had these westerns, and, and then you know somebody ran out of bullets, or uh, what do you believe they did? Well, they could have killed each other. That's true. Uh, no, but they want to fight the other one. How can they do it? Hmm? To run, yes, but that is not exactly fighting the other. I mean, yes, running. Uh, tomorrow you can can fight them again, but not today. How can you fight them today without without bullets? Yeah. Some sort of mini. mini? Uh, oh, so you use a sword. That's a great idea. No, so but that brings us back again. How do you get into the cell? Uh, and we will get to that in a minute. Uh, we will get to other ways of getting into the cell. No, but essentially you use the bullets that are being shot at you. So you repurpose. So red shoots bullets at you. Green doesn't have bullets anymore. So green uses the bullets from red. And Marek Basler is just about to publish something like that. Yes, he, he has absolutely data for that. He can exactly show this is exactly what these bacteria do. Run out of so they fire their own bullets until they, they run out of bullets and then they take the one from the other one and shoot back. Um, this is bacteria, bacteria warfare. It really happens like that. And, I mean, imagine there's something that builds up through the entire cell. It's an amazing amount of energy. And you need all of that energy uh, in a fast collapse to really, at a high pressure, shoot something at it. So the other way that happens, the more common way, brings us back to something else you said. Uh, he, he said that, yes, you want to protect the cell, but you actually need exchange. Why do you need exchange? So just putting concrete or cement around it wouldn't work. Yeah? So you need resources from the environment, yes. And you have to get rid of your garbage, exactly. Like, like in any city, in a I think about a cell a little bit like a medieval town, there's a wall around it, and they, they have, the cells have the same kind of problems. You, get, you need to get stuff in to, to survive food resources, and you need to get stuff out, uh, waste. Was that a question? Yes, now, but this is a slightly different one. So now, uh, calling the ions somehow the, the resources that you need to feed, in some sense it is, because this is what you need, the ionic potential, or the, the differential potential, in, uh, uh, is exactly what you need to operate, is that cell. So in some sense you could call it food. Uh, and for the functioning of, a new, of an axon that has to fire, that is exactly its purpose, right? Uh, so it's the same thing, you have a constant exchange. And now, this is the point here. The other way, so you said you walk around the cell and you sort of knock on the door and you sneak in the well, that was my misinterpretation of, of what you said. But essentially this is exactly what you try to do. You should try to hijack the mechanisms that the cell has to get things in and out. And one way in which we do that in everyday, well, not everyday, but one common way in which we do that is through drugs. What I show here on this slide is all the drugs according to where, where in which compartments they are. And you see that about 57% of all the drugs target membrane proteins. Target membrane proteins are exactly the gatekeepers. They are the ones that sit there and when you go around and find, want to knock somewhere, can I get in, then essentially what you try to get into is a membrane protein and that is exactly what drugs target. It's the first line of attack or defense of a cell and this is also what uh, viruses attack. This is what bacteria attack. So any attack on a cell and then a recovery of a cell begins with the gatekeepers and those are the membrane proteins. Yes? Yes, so there are two types of bacteria, uh, so-called gram-negative and gram-positives, and gram-negative have actually two cell walls, and they differ in their thickness and they differ in their features. Yes, that is true. But what I showed you before in the warfare, they actually shoot through both membranes at the same time. Uh, that was one of the images that I showed. Anyway, so most drug targets are against membrane proteins, and there we already get into the issue of membrane proteins, uh, there are, as far as we know, two major types of membrane proteins. 
one type is the helical type where you have essentially transmembrane helices. Now, okay, with the light is a little bit, let me try the next one here. Is that better? At least here it's better. So blue, red, yellow, green, uh, purple cylinders, they are all membranes. Uh, they, they all sit in the helices that go through the membrane and the way to think about the lipid bilayer you see something down here is sort of where you have a um, less clear signal where you don't have these rods anymore and up here where the rods end. In between is where the lipid sits. In the lipid you cross the lipid with this rod. The rod essentially is a long helix. Now, in the same image, you can see that up here, this the outside of the cell, these sort of mushroom structures, and again, here is the lipid. In the background, here is the lipid. Here is the lipid. And then again, up here, you see all kinds of other things that sit there. You could imagine those to be gatekeepers, those to be sensing signals. So you could, for instance, imagine in this particular case, uh, in this particular case, you would sense that something happens here and that would be transferred here. I do not have a transporter. I, no, I, I'll show you a transporter. Some of these really transport ions. So do not send signals, but really let stuff go through or transport actively ions through in the neurons. Now, the problem is that structural determination for membrane proteins is more complicated than structural determination for globular proteins, for non-membrane proteins. And the reason is they need their membranes in order to adopt the three-dimensional structure. And in the membranes, we cannot grow crystals. So we have to essentially remove the, the lipids, and the moment we remove the lipids, we unfold the structure. That is sort of the challenge in the whole game. That means that when we do Comparative modeling for membrane proteins, the blue fraction is of all the membrane proteins. How many do we experimentally know and can model by comparative modeling? The answer is this. And when we look at time, we, we see that in fact nothing much is changing. So the problem is a hard one. And we need to simplify and we find solutions, uh, at least for some aspects of this problem. And the simplest solution, the simplest aspect that we can address is so the green one here is supposed to be the lipid, in this particular case the inside, the outside. Uh, so you have in this particular case three helices going through the membrane. So the simplest task would be identify where the helix sits from the sequence. How many helices do you have? Where do they sit? And where does the protein start? Its first residue, so-called N-terminal residue, is, is that outside the cell? Or is that inside the cell? And it turns out that in fact for membrane proteins, these simple criteria, how many helices do you have, on which side does the protein begin, tell you a lot about the function of that protein. Uh, most receptors, most ion channels, for instance, have, have some particular way of looking like that. So you can identify them relatively simply by the number of transmembrane helices and their arrangement. Not quite all, but you can get to some point. So we have an example where just the helices, just the placement of the helices tells you something quite important about how that protein function. We could predict them and we talk about helices. So I showed you today again the neural network that predicts secondary structure. So we can predict helices, right? Now if we do that, then this is what we get. So the observed is the H, the red, the, the OBS observed line here. So that's the sequence. The observed secondary structure is a transmembrane helix in red. And the predicted is blue. That's the thing that does 72%, but it's totally wrong here. And the reason why it's totally wrong here is because it has learned to predict helices in normal proteins. In transmembrane helices, things are very different because now you're suddenly in a membrane helix that is surrounded by lipid. It's a different reality. And in order to get, catch this different reality here, somehow you may want to sort of try a different method. And the different method, for instance, could begin by the idea that hydrophobic residues are going to be in the membrane. You want to be hydrophobic to be next to the lipid. That's energetically favorable. Some amino acids shown in green here have a relatively high hydrophobicity that can be put into a scale. And here's a scale from David Eisenberg. Uh, so sorted such that higher values, are, higher hydrophobicity is here and lower hydrophobicity is down here. So you could simply take that 
and predict according to how hydrophobic a certain region is, whether it's a membrane helix or not. Now the problem with this one here already is here. Uh, the index that I showed you before is the green one. I now plot, uh, I'm not really sure whether I plot the actual value or the, uh, some, some information content of the value, but this is another hydrophobicity index and this is the yellow, uh, green and blue. Essentially all measure hydrophobicity. And it's very clear that they differ. And in some cases they differ uh, just a little bit. Okay, what is, what is my definition of a little bit? Actually, they never really differ, just a little bit. This is, this is the littlest bit they can differ. Uh, in, in some cases, it's absolutely extreme, the difference. Now, if I wanted to use hydrophobicity index to predict membrane helices, you immediately see there's an issue. Which one? The concept is very simple. The solution is not, and by the way, we use many different hydrophobicity indices. The things get more complicated. We use 160, and the story gets more complicated. Um, but we, what we could we do in order to predict membrane helices? We do not know which hydrophobicity index to take. How could we choose which one, or how could we advance to predict membrane residues? I give you a bunch of uh, hydrophobicity indices and you want to predict membrane uh, residues or membrane helices. How could you do that? Yeah? That's a, that's a great idea. So, but, so they, they, you're not quite answering my question, but you're doing my ne the next step. So if I gave you the right hydrophobicity index, then what you actually want to look for is something that has hydrophobicity in, in, in some, somewhere around it, right? So when I think about this window again, I sort of have something that extends in both directions until I hit the end of the lipid. Uh, but how do how would you find which height of obesity is best? What's the simplest thing you can do? So, on this slide, I gave you 168 different height of obesity indices or indices. What can you do? 168 is not a big number. You can try them all, right? You can just see how well do they fit. I have a bunch of uh, proteins for which I know the transmembrane helix. Let's just see how they fit. And let's find the one that fits best. Uh, by some criteria. Uh, the there's a very simple criteria. You just correlate hydrophobicity of that index with being in the membrane, yes or no. Then comes the next issue. Once you decide on one particular hydrophobicity index, that's the position, the residue position from residue 1 to 400. Uh, and that's this hydrophobicity index here. So when hydrophobicity is high, you call it membrane helix. Uh, now, what is high? So high could be here, right? Higher than two. Higher than two, you, in this particular case, if you took that as one, two, three, you would have three membrane helices, right? How could you see whether that is the right cutoff? You try out. You just try a bunch of different cutoffs, right? And see how well they work. So, one issue that I implicitly talked about, I said the membrane is about three nanometer wide. When you put the helix through, the membrane, you need a certain length for the helix. Otherwise, you cannot get through. And that length is in the ballpark of 20 residues. Okay? So, one thing is already clear. If, if my threshold is such that you're below 20, then it's too small. In this particular case here, actually, we have two lines. And the idea was to optimize the prediction method to fit into these two lines. Uh, to find the best model that fits into these two lines. Um, there's another aspect of the membrane helix prediction, that is the orientation. 
the topology. But I believe I will get in, into the topology issues on Thursday.